how good are alignments? So we can generate multiple alignments. One of the, I'll, I'll go through this reasonably quickly because it's a little bit, um, you know, again, it, it's kind of useful to know about this because if you kind of, somebody tells you, use this alignment method, it's the best. It's useful to say, well, how, what's the evidence? Why, why should I use that method? Um, so one of, the, one of the things you can do is create reference alignments using structure comparison. I showed you with the SH2 domains, and then compare alignments you generate from sequence to the alignments you get from structure. And this is something we did in my group some years ago. Um, created this thing called Oxbench, because I was in Oxford at the time. Although by the time we published the paper, I wasn't anymore. I was here, I think, by the time we actually published the paper. And it's a library of 672 multiple alignments from structure, and you can compare an alignment from sequence alignment program to alignment from structure alignment, see how good they are. And so, for example, um, this is a comparison of a, I don't know which is which, um, oh yeah, sequence alignment on top generated by an alignment program and a structural based alignment underneath. And you can see they're not identical. Um, and so you can compare these, and if you assume the structural alignment is correct, you can say how good your sequence alignment is. So, we did this on lots of different methods. And the point, the take home message here is the overall accuracy. This is, look, this is dividing up different methods here along here. Not all of these are contemporary. Nobody, some of these people don't use anymore. Cluster LW is still around. And tea coffee is still used widely. Um, and you can get to both of these in Jalview. Um, this is looking at the percentage identity range for each group of sequences. But the numbers here, if you look at them in terms of the accuracy, if you look at the numbers, they're all around 90%, apart from this one. All pretty good. So the message from this is actually none of these, these methods all produce pretty good alignments overall, if you, if you look at lots of sequence alignments. Um, the other question is how similar do sequences need to be before we can, oh sorry, there's two factors there. Sorry, I need to show you something else. The other thing is, as if you look for sequences that are less similar, as you might expect, as the sequence similarity reduces, even for the very best method, which is tea coffee in this test, um, the accuracy of the alignment goes down. So for sequences that really don't share very much sequence identity, the accuracy is really quite low, about 23% in that case. If they share a lot of sequence identity, it's nearly 100%. And you know, typically you're going to be looking at things maybe in a 20 to 30% range if you're interested. But there you're pretty good. We go down, it gets, gets worse. And it kind of makes sense as sequence similarity gets weaker between proteins. They become structurally more diverse. They are, they are you know, the, the, it's harder to align them because they are structurally more different. So the program will give you an alignment, but if the sequence is not very similar, that alignment might not mean anything. Is everyone still with me? Somebody's programming or reading their email or Facebooking something now. I can hear it clicking away, so. Your loss. How similar do sequences need to be before we can align them reliably? Well, one of the important things to, to think about is, um, is this. So one of the things that's often used is this measure of percentage identity um, for how similar sequences are. Um, it's quite useful, but you have to be careful with it because percentage identity is very dependent on how you align the sequences and it's also very dependent upon the length of the sequences. So this is shown here. These are all, each of these dots is a pairwise sequence alignment, so two sequences aligned, and a calculation of the percentage identity for that two sequence alignment. So percentage identity against the alignment length. And as you can see, and, and all of these sequence pairs are unrelated. So these are proteins that have an absolutely no relationship with them, each other at all. So they have completely different three-dimensional structures. They are not evolutionarily related, at least not in recent evolution. And yet, you can run them through an alignment program, you will get an alignment, and it will give you a number. And as the sequence's alignment length gets shorter, you'll see the likelihood that you get a high percentage identity. This scale ranges from 0 to 60. You'll see very short sequences. You'll see uh, identities of 40%. You know, even when you're out at 110, it scatters. You'll see, by chance alone, you'll see sequence identities 
of maybe you know 30 percent or something like that you can see these between sequences that are completely unrelated so the point of this is the point of this slide really is just to emphasize that percentage identity can be you can't use that on its own uh, when you're looking at sequences um, as the sequences get longer everything converges pretty much on about 18 percent so if you take sequences that are unrelated to each other you run them through dynamic programming sequence alignment program Clustal, or any of these programs, on average, you'll get uh, an alignment accuracy, you'll get a, a percentage identity of around 16 to 18%. So if you're seeing numbers like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that these proteins are related at all. So yeah, as I say, it's length dependent, it's insensitive, it's dependent on sequence alignment program and parameters. Sequence identity, people often don't say how it's calculated, but depending on how you calculate it, you can get very different numbers. A better measure, and unfortunately this is not something you can easily use in any of the programs you're going to use today, is to calculate a thing called a z-score. This corrects for the alignment length, um, it's as sensitive as the alignment method, and it's less sensitive to changes in the alignment method. And there's only one way to calculate it. And what you do to get a z-score is you align the sequences, you record a score, you shuffle the order of the amino acids in the sequences, and you realign them, and you get another score. And you do that 100 times. So you're basically saying, if I take the same amino acids, put them in a different order, and align them optimally, I'll get a score. If I do that, that's, so they're unrelated sequences. We know they're not related. How, and then you say, how different is your original sequence between the native sequence score from the ones from the shuffled? So it's a way of, it's a kind of uh, estimate of how unusual that score is compared to random sequences. Um, and you just calculate the z-score, you take the difference from the mean divided by the standard deviation, show that graphically. If we do shuffled scores, you get something like this for the, uh, the scores, centered on zero. In this case, I've normalized it to zero. Maybe our, our score for two sequences was out here, 4.3. Um, the mean was, for example, zero. It never is, it's always higher. Um, and the standard deviation is 1.8, then to calculate the score, it's the z-score is the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So it's just the distance this is away from the mean in standard deviation units. Standard deviation is a measure of the width of the distribution, and so it gives you a, a way to normalize. Jim, Jim, yes? There's something like it, just a normalized compared to random sequence. In this case, yeah, this is, this is a very simplest. I mean, obviously there are lots of... You know, I'm trying to cut a very long story short here, but yeah, in this case, you're randomizing the sequence. You take the sequence, you shuffle its order. Obviously, there are different ways you do, can do that, which affect the scores you get. You can, keep the, you can keep the composition the same and just randomly order. You can try to preserve local ordering, so local uh, features, because if you just randomize a protein sequence, you mess up its, the patterns. You know, things like helical patterns or beta street patterns, you lose those, that information. Uh, so you can, you know, there are different ways of doing shuffling. Um, but yeah, basically. And as with all of these kinds of approaches, it obviously depends on what you compare to as your random distribution. So there's, a, you know, but this gives you a number. And in fact, if you do it in this simplistic way, you get numbers that you can then relate to something. In this case, um, and here's an example. This is again from, this is a plot of the z-score against... Um, this is a different measure of accuracy in this case. It's looking at how well the secondary structures align to each other. But you'll see once the z-score in this case is above about six, the um, accuracy is, is, is pretty high. Um, well, 70%. Below six, you can't really say. It's incredibly variable. So the message here is if you do, when you, as your sequence similarity gets lower, you might be lucky and the alignment might be reflecting genuine similarities. You have to look for other evidence to support your alignment, like there's certain active site residues you know you've experimentally characterized in both proteins, and so they align, and maybe that will tell you that give you some confidence that part of the alignment's correct. Um, but as the sequences become, um, you know, as the sequences become more similar, you've got more confidence in the alignment. Um, the other thing to, to point out is the accuracy of alignment improves on multiple sequence alignment. So even if you're only interested in comparing, say, E. coli to human, include all the other sequences you can get your hands on that are related as well. 
because in general the accuracy of the alignment will go up. And one of the beautiful things about gel view is you can then subset, you can choose different subsets to find uh, subsets of sequences that give you, you know, where you remove things that are a bit weird, always in a group of sequences. If you, if you, do, if you do a blast search, you'll get back a bunch of sequences that vary in similarity to the one you're interested in. And you may not want to include all of those when you do the multiple alignment, or you may find they're different lengths and you want to cut them out or hide them from the alignment. You learned about how to do hiding and, and editing last week. So that's, these, these are features that you can do to ref improve the quality of your alignments. So alignment accuracy does improve on multiple alignment. This is to illustrate this. If you take pairwise, align two sequences pairwise and look at the accuracy and, um, or align those same two sequences as part of a multiple alignment of the family and look at the difference in accuracy. And you can plot that. This is plotted as a histogram for, I can't remember how many alignments now, quite a large number. Um, so numbers to the right of zero are where the multiple alignment is more accurate than a pairwise alignment, and numbers to the left of zero are where it's less accurate. So you can see that there are more examples of alignments that are better when you multiply align than there are those that get worse. There are some yeah, a lot worse. So you might be really unlucky in your multiple alignment. But usually you can see these when you look at the sequence alignment. You can see that something's gone. You know, you've got a sequence in there that's just really quite different and you shouldn't include it. Okay, so multiple alignments are on average more accurate than pairwise alignments. Why is it? I'll just quickly say, why is that the case? I think hopefully it's becoming clear. You're beginning to spot these you know, you're using these profiles which capture informa information about what's important in the alignment. But let's just look at that in terms of a very simple example. So here's, if you look at a single sequence, amino acids. Um, if you've got multiple sequences, you can start to see patterns of conserve, conserved residues. Um, in this case, conserved hydrophobic amino acids are highlighted. There's a glycine here. You start to see these positions that are preserving particular physicochemical properties. And they often correspond to positions that are buried uh, in the hydrophobics, correspond to positions that are buried in the protein structure. So this is why it's important to think, and we'll, we'll do, I'll do a more detail a bit later, I'll show you a nicer example than this um, whenever we get to it. Um, and you know, the hydro, if you're seeing conservation of a position, and you think about that in terms of structure, they're probably, conserved hydrophobics are probably buried in the protein core because they're conserved. Um, and uh, so you see them on the structure. So if we look at uh, multiple alignment, it, it can help knowing this. So if it's two sequences, this doesn't look like a bad alignment. There's some identical amino acids that line up. There's some uh, with similar physicochemical properties here, which have been highlighted with the dotted lines looks reasonable if you just had those two sequences. It's not great, but it looks reasonable. If we add, um, if you watch those two positions, now if we do multiple alignment on these two sets of sequences, you start to see stronger patterns. Now those two positions, there's a V and a G there, you find that actually that V and the G aren't conserved in those families at all. So your alignment, which was across here, probably isn't right, but if you look, there's actually a better alignment over here. So the correct alignment is like this. So multiple alignment, what multiple alignment program is doing that process by cap encoding the information in, in sub-alignments. In, in, as you build up this hierarchical alignment, it's encoding that information and using that to improve the quality of the alignment. Um, just to say why, why would, there's just a couple of, uh, as I say, there are different things you can use uh, different kinds of multiple alignments. So you might obtain the best full alignment of end sequences. So if you've got like a bunch of serine proteinases and you want to get the best alignment, you can do that across all the sequences um, using this hierarchical approach. But sometimes what you're interested in is aligning relative to one sequence. So you're interested in protein A, but you want to align everything else just to that protein, but using the information from the profile as you do it. And that is also, that's quite often very powerful and it's best when your subsequent analysis, anything you're doing downstream is focused just on that sequence. <clears throat> and this is the approach used in iterative protein profile searching. So Cyblast does this. It starts with a single sequence. It searches the database. It pulls back some sequences. It aligns them to that sequence. Takes that set of maybe 50 sequences it's found above the threshold. 
searches again with that alignment as a profile, brings in more sequences. And if, you use, if you're interested in using Cyblast, I recommend the NCBI website for it. You can control this process very nicely. Uh, it has a very nice interface to doing that kind of search. Um, so just to illustrate what that means, a normal hierarchical alignment, you'll get something like this. You'll have gaps appearing in the first sequence. Um, if you've got an alignment specific to sequence A, you can't really see this very well here, but there's red lines down here. There's a gap in sequence A, and essentially those regions won't necessarily be reported in the final alignment. You'll, you'll just see sequence A without any gaps in it, and you'll see positions conserved underneath sequence A, the query sequence. And this happens, so for example, in some of the JPRED outputs, which you'll look at probably next week, um, you'll see, um, you'll see you can, one of the representations is an alignment like that with gaps, no gaps in the first sequence. It makes it more compact. And if you're just interested in conservation of columns relative to that sequence, it's the best way to show it. Uh, if you're interested in generating the best overall alignment, then you want to see all the gaps and everything. Uh, what do we use it for? I said space to, for sensitive profile searching. I've already done this, I think. Um, yeah, phylogeny, presentation of sequence related results, improved prediction, secondary structure, disorder prediction. Both of these you can do within JALView. Transmembrane regions, you can't do that in JALView, but there are other resources, UCL, that allow you to do that, and pretty much any sequence related property. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Right. Um, Okay, so why are they useful for predictions? So as, as I've kind of alluded to, evolution highlights positions. When you're aligning sequences, you're looking back in evolution, and it highlights the amino acid important to maintaining the structure or function of the protein. And that's capture, you can capture that by visual analysis. And I say day three, it's actually, this is from an old slide, it's actually to, either today or ne probably next week we'll get onto this, about how how you can use, how you can analyze a multiple line in detail to understand structure and function of the protein. Okay, JALView, you know about because you're all experts. That's the team. You saw this last week, just to remind you, that these are important people, unlike me. There's Jim, who's not here today, and Mungo and, and, and Charles who are both here doing this course. Just thought it'd be good for them. <laughs> and Suzanne is at the back. Asleep. Oh no, you're waking up now. <laughs> He's filming this all um, for posterity, which is slightly scary. Okay, that's break time.